Sales leaders and business professionals, how many times have you had a sales opportunity in your pipeline that you were so sure it was going to close that you maybe even counted on your quarterly numbers before it came in and before you knew it, it just disappeared. In fact, up to 60% of qualified sales opportunities are lost to one thing, and that's no decision. Today, we're going to dive deep into why this happens. And more importantly, we're going to talk about how top sales performers do things differently to improve their win rate. I'm really excited for our guest today. His name is Matt Dixon. He's a leading sales strategist. He's the best selling author of a book called Challenger Sales. You've probably heard of it. It sold over a million copies worldwide. And his latest book, Jolt Effect, in my opinion, is one of the best, if not the best, sales book in the past decade. Now, even if you're not in sales, the principles of overcoming indecision and driving action apply across roles and industries. Welcome to the Learn It All podcast, the show for today's leaders who want to get ahead and stay ahead of the game, because we know great leaders aren't born or made, they're constantly in the making. I'm Damon Lemby, two-time best-selling author and CEO of Learn It, a live learning platform that has helped upskill over 2 million people in the past three decades. I've been looking forward to this conversation with Matt because I've been literally advocating the Jolt framework for several years. So in our conversation today, we kick it off and we talk about the research behind Jolt Effect. And during COVID, they studied 2.5 million sales calls during that time. And a big part of our conversation is about what high performers do differently. And we touch on the challenger sales and how it fits in with the Jolt framework. And near the end of our conversation, Matt gives us a great preview of his new book that's going to be coming out mid-year 2025. Let's jump into this fantastic conversation with Matt. I was at a sales conference a couple of years ago, and a couple of people at my table were talking about Jolt Effect and kind of perked my ears up. I went out and got the book. Let's just start with, go through the research and what you found. Yeah. I I mean, I think the research itself, since you're familiar with a lot of the other work that we've done, um, the research itself is actually part of the story. So um, I think if we we go back to the... um, the heady times of March 2020, when the entire world like started to fall apart on us. Um, obviously, it was the the days of of Tiger King and learning to bake sourdough bread and all the you know all the good stuff. And but you know it was an interesting time in sales because um, while virtual platforms like Zoom and Teams and WebEx and the like were were certainly occupying more of the sales cycle for every salesperson out there. Um, talking about B two B salespeople, of course. Um, it was nowhere near like even a majority of the sales interaction was happening over over these virtual platforms, except for maybe SaaS companies where, you know, you had a lot of um, uh, kind of headset wearing younger SaaS sales executives and they were they were on Zoom all day long. But March of 2020, everything went virtual. So even, you know, in old line kind of manufacturing businesses, industrial products, uh, et cetera, those sellers suddenly were doing all of their sales uh, over Zoom. And so it was a pretty interesting time because it it actually was, I think, I'm mean, a hope it's a once in a lifetime opportunity or a once in a lifetime moment where every single sales interaction was happening uh, over virtual platforms. And that meant that they could be recorded and studied uh, with modern technology, AI and machine learning, which is what we did. So we recruited several dozen companies uh, into a study that lasted oh, is about a year to 18 months. We asked them to send us all of their recorded sales calls appended to the the CRM records, right? So we could track whether those deals closed or how they were eventually closed out. Um, and uh, we collected two and a half million sales calls in total. And, you know, there's a lot of things you could study um, with that big data set. And surely there's a lot more stuff we could go and, and delve into. But there was a really big surprise that jumped up uh, out to us right away, which is that about 40 to 60% of the average salesperson's uh, qualified pipeline ultimately was marked as closed, lost, no decision in their CRM system. So that, if you think about it from an indi- individual um, seller standpoint, or if you're a leader, uh, as many of your listeners are, and they're overseeing teams or entire sales organizations or entire companies, right? Um, you think about that multiplied across the entire sales team, it is a massive, massive uh, deadweight loss. And here was the rub is that a lot of the things as we dug into these calls, a lot of these deals, it seemed like sellers were doing exactly the right stuff. They were in there. They were, um, you know, helping the customer understand the cost of their inaction. They were dialing up the FUD and creating that burning platform for the customer, you know, making them squirm a little bit. Um, 
And they were using critical events and urgency drivers, like, you know, the 10% discount that's only good this quarter. Like they're doing all the stuff they've been trained to do. And in fact, as as I was um, going back through this call data, you know, from the challenger sale, you remember we talk about the status quo as being the salesperson's biggest competitor. And this has long been the kind of conventional wisdom in sales. In the challenger sale, we we say specifically, challengers are very good at showing the customer that the pain of same is actually worse than the pain of change, right? So they don't acknowledge that changes is, um, or they acknowledge that change can be difficult, but they also point out the fact that staying put is actually more costly to you and your business. And so it seemed like these sellers were doing all the right stuff. They were doing exactly what we say challengers do, but we found something kind of head scratching, which is that for customers who said during the sale that they were quote unquote in, right? They're sold. Like you, you can stop selling to me, Damon. Like I'm in, I get it. I understand the problem. I understand that you are the provider we should work with. This is a priority for our business. Let's go. A huge percentage of those deals ended up nevertheless being lost to no decision. And here's the, the kicker is that when sellers went out and if you will, dialed up the FOMO, right? You're going to miss out on these benefits. You're going to miss out on solving these problems. You're just going to miss out on this 10% discount I'm offering you this quarter. It actually made things worse, not better. It increased the odds that the deal would be lost to no decision. And this was this completely flummoxed us. We did we had no idea what this meant. And and the first thing my my gut reaction was, um, you know, I spent the last 12, 13 years traveling around the world telling people that, you know, to to go and defeat the status quo right. in the same as what <laughs> do the challenger thing. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And he, and I'm like, I wonder what a global apology tour is gonna sound like. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. And the second thing I did is I went and accused the data science team of having made a mistake, which of course they assured me they did not. Then we loaded more data into the model and actually the effect became more pronounced and more significant. So we figured out we what we realized is that there's something going on here with these hesitant customers that we don't fully understand. So in a nutshell, what we what we found is that um, when you look at these no decision losses, while we as salespeople have long been told that when a customer makes no decision, they are in fact making a decision. They're deciding to stay with their status quo. And that is true, but it's true for only 44% of those uh, customer deals that are, are those deals that are lost to no decision. It's actually the smaller of the two reasons that we found. The second reason, 56% of the time, Deals are are marked as close loss, no decision, not because the customer prefers their status quo, but rather because they're indecisive about how to move forward. And that indecision itself uh, itself stems from their fear of failure. In other words, these customers want to buy your product or your service or your solution, but they just can't. Now, here's I think this this in and of itself is a bit of a head scratcher for salespeople too, and I, I think especially for sellers who sell at senior levels of an organization, right? I, I sell the CFOs or I sell the heads of sales or even CEOs. These are rational actors, right? They get paid a lot of money to make really tough decisions on behalf of their their shareholders, their investors, their employees, their customers. And you're telling me they're afraid of failing. And actually, it turns out that's very much the case. So we spend more time than I will wish upon any of your listeners actually delving into um, decades worth of social science research, cognitive psychology, um, uh, in other uh, behavioral economics. And I think a lot of sellers are familiar with loss aversion, right? This idea that nobody likes to lose that. That's why we dial up the FUD. That's why we use the 10% discount or the exploding offer that's only good this quarter because we know nobody wants to pay more later, right? People hate to lose. Um, but what we discovered is as powerful as that loss aversion is, it's really important for sellers to understand that there are two types of loss in the customer's mind. On the one hand, you've got what are called uh, errors of commission, an error of commission is when you, um, or sorry, errors. I only start with errors of omission. An error of o- omission is when you lose out by doing nothing, right? So you decide to stay on the sidelines. You don't take advantage of an offer or an opportunity, and you and your maybe your company, your team, your investors experience a loss as a result. Um, that's painful. But the opposite of that is an error of commission. An error of commission is when you made a decision, you chose a course of action, and that decision itself led to a loss. And between those two, it turns out, and the social science is very clear in, on this, is that errors of commission weigh much more heavily on us as as people. In other words, we are much more afraid of messing up than we are of missing out. And so we've been talking with the shorthand for the jolt effect. Right? The argument is that you got to understand the FOMO is powerful for your customer because they don't want to miss out. But actually what they care more about is the FOMU, the fear of messing up. Or faux foo, but you told me this is a family friendly podcast, right. so your listeners can figure out in their own what that stands <laughs> for. But but that's a very powerful aha for sellers, right? To understand that 
look, there is a time and a place in the sale to dial up the cost of inaction, to show the customer the pain of same is the worst and the pain of change, to beat the status quo, to dial up the FUD, to use the urgency driver. But when your customer says either they articulate this or they send you a signal that it's time to stop selling me, I'm in. I get it. We're, we're good. Let's move forward. What starts to then occupy their mind is what could go wrong. And so there's a time and a place to push, if you will, and then there's a time and a place to basically put your arm figuratively, not literally because that would be creepy, around your customer's shoulders and instill confidence with them that they've made a great decision and they've chosen a great path forward and you've got their back. So that's really what Jolt is about, is, is about that second playbook. Um, and the, the reality is in sales, we've only ever talked about the first playbook and nobody ever spends time talking about how we instill customer confidence and how we get them comfortable with this decision, this big risk they're about to take. Absolutely. And and first of all, listeners, I want you to just think for a second, as terrible as COVID is, you get somebody like Matt and his team, what an what a field day they get to to be able to to sift through this data. I mean, it was just because I couldn't bake sourdough bread, so we went yeah, to this instead. <laughs> but you but you <laughs> right. but you can watch Tiger King. I mean, sure, I was this a is huge true, fan. Right? Huge fan <laughs> of Tiger King. So you get all this information and, and it's it, and it's crazy and you come up with this. And I, and I guess you fast forward now, and I bet that that 40 to 60% has actually gone up to notice. Absolutely. It absolutely has. And so um, I remember when we launched this event, or sorry, this book, it was at um, Dreamforce in 2022 in San Francisco. And uh, you were probably there as well. And I was there yes. and I was ta- uh, we were doing some book launch events. And I was talking to heads of sales who were very familiar with Challenger and some of the other work that had preceded this book. And we tell them a little bit about what the book's about. And for, for a lot of these sales leaders, not that long ago, I got a little bit of like a, you know, like a furrowed brow, like a squinty kind of area. Like, I don't think we lose a lot of deals to no decision. Like, I'm sure we lose some, but no, nah, probably not. Fast forward to today and what's happened over the past two years, especially in like the tech market. And I've been talking to leaders who I met in 2022 who told me that was not a big deal for their sales teams who have come back and said, we ran the numbers. It's actually more like 70 or 80% for us. We get strung along all the time and then these deals never close. They just they just kind of evaporate. They slip through our fingers and, and disappear. And I think a lot of that has to do with exactly what you said. The second reason why deals are lost is because people are afraid to stick their neck out there because Matt, these days, it could cost them their job. That's 100% right. Yeah. You know, um, they're, what we say in the book, and I think this is very true, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but um, if you look at companies, large and small, like people don't really get fired for perpetuating the status quo. Like lots of people kick the can down the road before you did, and you're just one more person kicking the can down the road. But people do get fired for changing the status quo in ha- when it goes wrong. They're heroes when it goes right, but they're villains when it goes wrong. And it, in today's environment, yeah, it can cost you your job. I mean, think about all these um, all these companies that invested in SaaS products. You know, bought every you know every single product on the market, all the bells and whistles, and then things got tight. And the CFO starts looking and realizes nobody's using this stuff, right? Oh, and yeah. we're locked into a three year agreement. I mean, that's that's a bad day, right? That's a that's a really bad day, and that that's not just SaaS. That's also can be professional services, absolutely. You know, yeah. In the sense where, like, even with our business, if somebody invests two hundred thousand dollars in training, and then a, a year comes up and sixty percent of that's not used, the C, the CFO is like, "What's going on here?" Right? You know, that's and, exactly and that, right. That could put whoever went out on a limb to make that investment, you know, at risk. Now. Part of it, which I also find really fascinating, is that you say that a, a lot of leaders believe that they're great decision makers, right? That they don't have indecision, but that's not actually the case, right? No, not at all. <laughs> actually, so it's funny because if you asked um, uh, ten of your customers or a hundred of your customers, um, uh, it's funny. Think about the senior executives, the C level decision makers, the economic buyers, the budget holders. Um, if they consider themselves to be decisive uh, managers, every single one of them would raise their hand um, and say, yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm decisive. I make the tough calls. I manage from the gut. You know, I take them a risk taker. But if you actually um, uh, look at this uh, it, with data, what you find is that um, about uh, 87% or 87 of those 100 would be lying to you. So, they, so yes, that's there a are big decisive. number. It's a big number. It, that's a big are, number. Uh, what that translates to, we actually found that um, uh, buyer indecision expressed in either 
moderate or high degrees in 87% of the two and a half million sales calls that we studied. So 13% of the time, yeah, you've got a decisive person, a rash, somebody who's purely thinking in dollars and cents, um, purely thinking in ROI, they're very rational decision, decision makers, unencumbered by the fear of failure. And what I always tell salespeople is if you find one of those people, you should sell them everything as soon as you can. But Absolutely. the problem is like 87% of the time, you're not dealing with that. You're dealing with moderately or deeply indecisive uh, customers. But here's the the problem with that is that customers, uh, talking about being indecisive is not anything customers want to talk about. Like no customer is going to say, hey, I don't know how to say this, but I'm actually kind of worried about getting fired for agreeing to the solution or, or my boss already hates me. And like, if this goes sideways, you know, she's going to hate me even more. Like, People don't talk about that stuff. They like to, they, they, we all suffer, either suffer from the Dunning Kruger effect, which is we think we're better at things than we really are, or we're just putting on like false airs and trying to play the part of the decisive manager. But um, it's, it's very hard to get that out. And that actually becomes more uh, pronounced the higher you go. So the more senior you get in the organization, the more indecisive those buyers uh, tend to be. I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story. So I did a, um, a round table of uh, top clients for a big software company. And um, there was a CTO in attendance from one of the big uh, Fortune 100 manufacturers out there. So company everyone, all of your listeners would know by name. And I was starting to go through the research and I was talking about what you, what you just asked about, um, uh, about the fact that most managers are actually either not honest or, or not self-aware enough to know that they're actually suffering from indecision and fear of failure. And uh, this CTO, she actually got very upset at the suggestion and, and said, I get, I make a hundred tough calls a day. I would get fired if I was ever afraid of making a decision. I just like flat out reject all of your data. Um, she actually ended up having to leave um, early after all the clients left the, uh, the account management team that was hosting this dinner and that hired me to speak at the round table said to me, you know, she's actually our most indecisive client. That we have. <laughs> <laughs> so again, but it, it makes people really upset. Like if you ask, if you ask your customers um, if they have trouble making decisions, just don't let the door hit you on the way out because people will get very offended by that, um, which raises lots of lots of uh, problems. I should back up. You know, the JOLT, uh, Jolt effect, JOLT is an acronym for those um, listeners who've read the book will already know this. But those who don't, um, it stands for judging the level of indecision, offering your recommendation, limiting the exploration, and taking risk off the table. Um, everything that we're talking about here. Uh, start is in that J kind of category. How do we understand if the person we're talking to is actually suffering from indecision? Um, how do we gauge the depth of their indecision? How do we figure out as a salesperson, can I get them over the hump? Right? Is there anything I can do or are they completely wrapped around the axle of fail, like fear of failure and I should just spend my time elsewhere? Um, one of the things we found, this is pretty interesting. We talk about judging the level of indecision. Uh, there's a technique we discovered um, that high performers use or they've, kind of, they've never been taught to do this, but they developed this on their own. And the analogy I would use is uh, from submarine warfare. So I apologize for the militaristic reference, but I think about um, pings and echoes. So we all remember the hunt for an October, right? One ping only. Um, so think about um, sending a ping into the water and then listening for the reflection back. And that's very much, much what high performers do. What they don't do is ask a question like, Damon, do you consider yourself to be a decisive uh, manager? Like, that's not a great question. It'll get you booted from the office or your client's office, what they do is they send out a ping and they listen for the reflection back. The ping is them trying to articulate the fear they think the customer is suffering from, but not in a way that is accusatory or meant to out them in any way, but in a way that um, uh, contextualizes it. And even more importantly, makes it seem perfectly normal. So an example might be, um, you know, we, we talk about the big sources of indecision. It's It tends to be, I'm overwhelmed by too many options. I'm overwhelmed by too much information. I'm overwhelmed by the risk and what, you know, that I don't think I'm going to get what I'm paying for, uh, or I'm not going to see the benefits from this decision. Or, or Matt, uh, a big one right now has to be as well, that there's just so many other um, competing priorities. So many priorities. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know how this stacks. And and that I would put in that that risk category, right? It might not be risk with this. It might be that we spent our time and money on the wrong thing, right? Um, so no, I think you're absolutely right. And that is very true of understaffed, you know, um, uh, strapped kind of leadership teams that have tons of priorities that they're navigating right now. But uh, but back to the pings and echoes, what I would tell you is like, let's imagine that, that I'm a software sales um, executive and I'm selling uh, to you as a business leader, uh, Damon, I, and I'm 
showing you all the configurations and I'm showing you all the partner integrations we can offer and I'm showing you different bells and whistles and feeds and speeds and features and benefits. At some point, um, what I might say to you, because I, I will probably recognize the fact that while customers say they like lots of options, they actually have trouble picking one. And so what I might say to you is something like, you know, Damon, we've been, uh, this is uh, a couple of months now that we've been engaged. We had a great proof of concept with your team. I think the demos that we've done uh, have been, have gone over very well. I really appreciate your candor in this whole process. One of the things that occurs to me as I reflect on other clients that I've been down this path with is that um, sometimes we do our clients a disservice to be you know um, self critical for a moment. We put a lot of stuff in front of them, and I just know that your team has really liked. Well, it seems like they've really liked all the stuff we've shown them, all the use cases, all the integrations, all the different uh, bells and whistles. But I also know that you told me very early on, you, you know, you can't have it all and you need to be really choiceful about where you invest your, your dollars right now um, and, and where, you know, what you decide to move forward with. So I would love to understand if you were clear yourself about, of all the stuff we've shown you, what's nice to have and what's need to have. And the reason I ask that, again, is that at this point in the sales process, a lot of my prospects I find actually struggle with that because we, again... It's like going to the buffet and they see all the stuff. It's like, oh my God, it all looks amazing. I'm afraid of making the wrong decision. Now, it may be that you you know exactly what you want. And, and if so, I'd love to hear from you so that I can really start to focus this discussion and start working as towards a proposal that is tailored to what you're looking for. Um, but if not, I'd love to be a resource to you and help you kind of navigate what I think is a pretty hard decision, actually. What do you put in and what do you leave out or, or save for later? And you know what your customer might say in response is... Um, uh, no, actually, uh, we're just very nice people. There's a lot of stuff you showed us we have no interest in. Let me tell you exactly what we're looking for. And this is a great this is a great jumping off point to the next stage in the conversation as we work towards a configured solution for us. Or they might say, yeah, you know, um, we actually were just talking about this the other day. We really do have a hard time. Uh, we would have a hard time prioritizing. We could use some help. What do other customers like us start with? What would be a good initial deployment? Um, what can we wait and do later? Um, how do we get the most bang for the buck right now, get some wins on the board, and then expand from there, right? So it's not it's not uh, co- uh, confronting your customer. It's not embarrassing them. It's making the customer seem feel perfectly normal because people like me struggle with this decision too. It's okay. And I know this is actually a big decision. It's a hard decision, and I want to help. And so it, it, it gets this indecision and fear of failure on the table so that it can be dealt with and managed in a productive way. No, I, I think that that's great. And there's so much there, but I want to take it back a step for our listeners. One of the things that I love about this book and Challenger Sales too, is that they really identify what average performers do differently than high performers. And so like with my team at Learn It, a lot of times we'll look at a particular situation and I'd say, you know, after we read the book, give me an example of what a higher performer would do here versus an, uh, a, a, an average performer. And, and, that's, and that's huge right there. One thing I want to point out about that is really, which is O on on Jolt, right, is is offer a recommendation, is I've seen that high performers, great salespeople, they build trust with their customers if they come in with a point of view, right? That that helps a lot. Quick story of a big deal we lost probably six or seven years ago to a large, um, well, a growing biotech firm is we were trying to be ultra flexible, Matt, with these with the with the chief people officer. And we said, we can customize, we could do whatever you want, right? And, and, and we'll make it work. We lost the deal. Um, and, and that person's partner, um, life partner, uh, was a big client of ours at a different uh, financial institute. And they said, well, she didn't go with you because she doesn't have time to figure this out. And she wants somebody who has a point of view and you know you got to come in as the expert yourself, and so we kind of lost the trust. So it, it was good to come in. You know, you got to listen to the customer, but you also have to give them a point of view. Otherwise, like you said, sometimes there's just too many options. They don't know what's going on, or they don't really have the time to go for it. And I've heard you say a bunch too. People are also afraid of missing out, making a decision, it, it, making a decision, and then realizing after they made a decision. When I say missing out. They're like, oh, I should have got that instead. Purchase regret. Got, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Purchase regret. It, you know, it's uh, you're exactly right. And you're describing perfectly the O in Jolt, which is offering your recommendation. And what most salespeople do is they they want the customer to make the decision. And they want to be eminently, just as you described in your own experience, 
eminently configurable and customizable. And, you know, customer asks you jump, you you ask how high. And like salespeople become bobblehead dolls at some point where they just say yes to everything the customer wants um, because they're so afraid of of saying something. The customer saying, well, that's not actually what we're interested in. And now you've created this chasm between you and the customer. So you just agree with everything the customer wants. And when the customer expresses some difficulty making a decision, salespeople often will compound that by putting the decision back in the customer's place. So you might say to me, you know, I don't know, like we've only got this much to spend and everything you've shown me looks great, but how do we make sure we get the most bang for the buck in our first uh, implementation with you is just like a raging success. And then we can expand from there. We can add more stuff later, help me out. And what most salespeople do is go back and say, you know, Damon, um, why don't you tell me what problem you're really trying to solve here? Because I, what I, I don't want to make this decision. I want you to make it because the customer is always right. And we've been taught for many, many years, like customers love options. They want to make their decision. They want to configure to their own needs, et cetera. But just like your client, that prospect you were talking about before, um, what they really want is for somebody to tell them what they should go do. It, it's a little bit like in um, uh, social science is very clear on this one too. There's a, there's a psychological effect. Um, it's called the delegation effect. And here's a simple um, illustration. If you go into a restaurant and you're looking at the menu, and imagine it's a high-end place and all the dishes are very expensive and you don't want to make a bad decision, right? You want to make sure you love your meal because you're going to pay through the nose for it. So you better love it. And you ask the wait person, um, you know, what's what's good here? What do you recommend? And they turn around to you and say, well, what are you in the mood to eat tonight? That's like super unhelpful, right? It it's does the no same good. thing. It, it, it does, does you no good. All. You are no closer to a decision than you were when you asked a question. But what great weight people do, and we've all had this experience before, is they'll say, you know, this is actually our most popular dish. If you read our Yelp reviews, like half of them mentioned this dish. Um, we run out of it every night. We still have it tonight, thankfully. So if you're interested in that, we can get it for you. But here's another one that I really like a lot. It's a personal favorite. Uh, it's a vegetarian dish, a little bit lighter. So if you're not as hungry, because the first option is a lot of food. I like this one too. It's a little bit of a kind of sleeper classic. It's one of my personal favorites here. Now, what happens is if you, let's say you order one of those two dishes and you don't like it, well, whose fault is it? Technically, it's your fault because you ordered it, but it's also kind of their fault because they recommend it. They told you to order it. And so that's the delegation effect. You share the burden of a bad choice is now shared between the recommender and the decider versus it being all on your, your plate. And we found that best salespeople do the exact same thing. They, they, they let a thousand flowers bloom, but then they break out the weed whacker and they kind of chalk the field and say, if I were you, I would go in this direction because based on my experience with companies just like you, this is the right way forward. Uh, customers who go down this path, they become raving fans of ours. They love it. They just start expanding from there. And that's, again, just ba if you want my honest view, that's what I would go do. But ultimately, it's up to you. And so if you'd like to go in a different direction, I'm more than happy to help you do that. So that creates a little bit of flexibility, but it also instills that confidence that I'm working with somebody who's done this before. I'm going to go with their recommendation, right? Just like your your prospect was looking for. It, well, I love that. And so listeners, think about this for a second. First of all, none of your customers or your prospects want it to be your first rodeo, yep. right? So that, I mean, nobody, nobody wants that. So just by saying other customers like yourself... And I think an added benefit is if you could throw in the same industry, right? Sure. If somebody's yeah. in healthcare, they don't really care what goes on in retail. So. Other healthcare providers like you, other banks uh, other, like you, other, other yeah, banks yeah. like you. Yeah. And then what Matt's saying, which is so true, is that even the perception of you sharing the risk and the ownership, it helps it helps de-risk the sale a little bit be because you know, I mean, there's that old saying, and, and not to get off subject, but nobody loses from buying um, IBM or gets yes. fired for buying, buying from IBM, if it is even IBM. But eventually, you're sharing the risk, and, and in, their, in your customer's mind, they're saying, okay, well, this is what other in, in our industry are doing, so this has to be a good one. Um, and then they can move forward from there. So I, I think that that's, that's really- It creates really that psychological key. safety net. You're 100% right. Getting back to the whole framework- it doesn't have to go in order, right? Everything starts. Absolutely with, not. Yeah. So that's, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, that's a you know it's a it's a great point, and I think because it's a it, it's a linear kind of acronym. Of course, people assume it's you do one after the other, but I, I always tell them when when I'm walking through this, um, it starts with that J. Just kind of getting the lay of the land, using your pings and echoes, um, understanding the context of the clients operating, and maybe they are normally a decisive uh, manager. But they're working in an environment right now where there's a lot of budgetary pressure. Maybe their company is under a lot of stress. They're losing market share. They're a lot. They've made a, a, some bad investments recently. There are a lot of eyes on this decision. 
So that could take a normally very decisive person and actually make them quite indecisive around this specific um, uh, purchase. So, But everything starts there. And then based on what you find, you might apply the O, the L, or the T. Now, we talked about the O, but let me say a few words about the other two, the L and the T. So the L is about limiting the exploration. So this comes from the problem of information overload. You know, our, our customers, um, they, they want to be experts before they make a decision. But the problem is they're never going to be as smart as this, about this stuff as we are. They'll never be at our level because we eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. We talk about it all day long, every day. And this is, might be a once-in-a-career decision for them. So, uh, you know, think about uh, you know, any maker manner of, of um, uh, purchase. And then think about those really, you know, new bleeding edge things like AI based solutions. And that even amps it up, right? Because nobody understands how this stuff works and nobody, and it, but everyone tries to become an expert, to le- develop an ex- level of expertise. Now, we've got to understand, I think, the reason that customers do that. It's not because they're desperate to read every white paper on earth and know everything about CRM or AI or, what, you know, whatever the, the technology is or, or the solution is or the product is. It, they do that stuff because they're afraid that the salesperson is not going to be honest with them. So there's something called the agency dilemma, which is very much in play um, in sales, which is when one party knows more than the other about the decision that uh, the the counterparty is being asked to make. So think about it. A salesperson selling a solution to a customer, um, they know they know all the stuff about the solution that doesn't work. They know all the, the clients who've turned out. They know all the things that are kind of we talk about, but they're not capabilities that are ready for prime time. Uh, they've got all the dirty laundry. They just don't air it with the customer. And customers feel like coming into the um, the sales process with the salesperson, they feel like are they're expecting to be that every question they ask, they're going to get a yes. We can do that. They're expecting that this seller is not going to be honest about the real capabilities as well as the real deficiencies of the solution. Um, and so they feel like it's a bit of a, um, a detective game for them or a cat and mouse game where I am trying to find out what you're hiding from me. So I'm going to go do my own research to see if it validates what you're telling me. I'm going to go to my LinkedIn network. I'm going to talk to other customers of yours on my own, not reference customers you're steering to me to, but people I know who actually use your technology who you're not recommending I talk to. Now I want to get the real scoop. I'm going to read analyst reports and and this endless this information cons- consumption can go on and on and on. And it can be a massive um, uh, source of no decision losses because eventually the customer just kind of gives up. And then I feel like I'm never going to become decision an expert fatigue. on this. Decision fatigue. Decision fatigue. And then I just ghost you, right? They go radio silent. Um, now, this is really dangerous because average performers, when the customer's on the phone with them saying, hey, can you send me like another, can I do another reference call? Can we do one more demo? Can I? Can you send me that white paper that you mentioned before? Can you send me the link to that webinar you guys did last year? Your average performer is thinking, "This is great. Sure, I have some. I have something to tell yeah. my manager, like that. I just did with this customer. Like they're making progress. But high performers understand that a certain amount of learning and and uh, research is normal. But beyond a certain uh, point, it becomes analysis paralysis. And so, the key to stopping that really is trying to get the customer to stop trying to be an expert and trust you as their expert. And the way that you do that, and it, this sounds uh, kind of simple, but there's two steps. The first one is. You should be early on in the sale, very honest, um, almost um, dangerously honest with your customer about uh, things that you are not good at, um, places where your competitors outperform you, um, capabilities that are not ready for prime time. When you do that with your customer, they suddenly their guard kind of comes down and their thought process is not, this person's just getting paid to oversell me and hide the dirty laundry and put one over on me, but rather this person's just here to get me to a great decision. And if I ask them a question, I'm going to get an honest answer. So the next question they're going to ask is, you know, I, I need to do a little bit of research on this. Is there anything you recommend? Sure. Here's a podcast. Here's actually a buying guide from one of our competitors. You should definitely read it. Uh, here's the analyst report. Shows you how we rank relative to our, our competitors. Again, for your use case, we think we're the best in the market. But if you're looking for another use case, I can recommend other solutions as well. We want you to make a great decision. That's a very powerful place to be because now suddenly your customer is turning to you asking for advice versus trying to figure out what is this guy hiding from me? Uh, now, the the other thing you got to do is you've got to demonstrate expertise, right? So it's one thing to be honest, but it's another thing for the customer. You've got to you got to know what you're talking about. So back to what you said before, Dan, and other banks like you, other healthcare providers like you, but you got to have some basis of understanding. You've got to know your product at some level. And the problem is, in a lot of sales calls today, salespeople show up with like this clown car of experts, and they just kind of punt. 
to everybody else. They're like, this is one of my, let me, let me just stop you for one (laughs) second. Uh, For our listeners, I was waiting for this because this is something, this, this is very, very important. I'll let, let me just go ahead with that. Cause I think this is very important where they just kind of hand it over to their clown card of experts. And, and you know, look, I, what I don't mean to suggest, and I've had people come up to me and say like, I work in, in the product team or I work in the solutions engineering team or customer success. And what do you mean? Like our salespeople shouldn't invite us. Like, that's all we're saying. They absolutely should, but they should invite you when they are out of their depth and and when they have gotten over the tips of their skis a little bit and when they need the expert there to instill that confidence, but they should use you in not a, they shouldn't use you in a carpet bombing way, but as a precision, precision guided, you know, munition, like to answer a specific question for the customer. So when you show up with the clown car of experts and your posture as a seller is like, hey, I brought Damon, he's the head of product and I brought, you know, Susan and she's the head of client success and I brought Jim and Jim's the head of engineering and take it away, guys. And the customer loves like the conversation and you're sitting back as a seller and you're smiling to ear to ear and you're like, boy, this is great. The customer's eating this up. But something really dangerous is happening at the same time. The customer may love it, but you are in the process of that happening. While you're not saying anything and adding any value at all, you're letting them run with your sales call. You are getting delegated down to the person you sound like. And if you sound like an admin and you sound like somebody whose only value is to do calendar Tetris and get all these people together for a call, why would the customer ever listen to your recommendation on anything? Like you, you don't, you're not in a position of authority. So great salespeople, I'm not saying they're trying to become masters of every technical dimension of their products. That's not what they get paid to do. But they true try to carry the baton as far as they can down the down the track before they hand it off. And when they bring in their partners, they choreograph it very, very tightly. So I would say, Damon, I'm bringing in um, customers got a question about you know data integration or GDPR or something like that. I don't know the answer to that. I want to listen because I'd love to know the answer in case it comes up again. So I'll be listening intently and taking notes. But I'm going to run the call and I'm going to hand off to you. And then I'm going to need to tell the customer that you need to run to another call because I need them to come back and, and engage with me. I don't want them going directly to you. I want them coming to me and seeing me as the expert. And and you know the, your product partners are, are fine with that. They want to help. But if you let them help as a product, I could tell you, we will help for the entirety of the hour call. <laughs> we'll eat up the entire thing. Yeah. And, and what happens, and listeners, really how I boil it down, what Matt's saying is you can't lose ownership of the relationship yeah, with your customer. Yeah, you got it. And in this day and age where trust is really at an all-time low with customers, I mean, they're already wondering and they're skeptic. And if you come in as, as a salesperson and you surround yourself and you think you're helping, right, by getting all these experts, in the back of their mind, they're saying, well, what does Matt have to offer? Right? Exactly. Now, exactly. on the flip side, they're also going to know that it, it, you you can't you know, be the jack of all trades, master of nothing either, right? You, you know, so what Matt's saying, which I think is so important, is like you're quarterbacking it. Like you want a GDPR, I'm bringing this in. You know, that's a great metaphor. In. Yeah, and you're and you're, and, yep. and you're and you're running the show because then what happens is the trust is built up with the customer. Like, okay, this this person not only can speak to it at a certain level, but he knows who to go and find for me when when it's time to bring him into the conversation. I think that is so powerful. And it's so under realized in uh, your typical sales uh, professional. You know, and, and I think some in a lot of the kind of uh, GTM organizations out there, especially if you look at like the SaaS market, it, just as an example, are I mean, there are just legions of people there to help you on sales calls, like product people, engineering people, customer support people, the executive sponsors, um, uh, engineers, you name it. And it's just, Everyone wants to help. Everyone's job is to help sell and close deals and drive company growth. And um, in salespeople, I think in some way they've kind of abdicated their responsibilities to be to develop a modicum of expertise around the product themselves. And again, it's not to say that you need to be a coder or you need to go be at that same level of technical detail, but you do need to be pretty conversant in the product and you should make it a goal from day one when you start to the day you leave to develop more and more expertise. And the, the beautiful place to be is when your customer does see you as the quarterback and they say, first, David, let me ask you this question. And some of the some of those questions, and as every day passes and you learn, you're going to be able to answer more and more of those questions yourself. But when you can't say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that, but I know exactly who to ask. So let me go get an answer for you or let me get you on the phone with that person. Uh, and so you can have a discussion about it. So yeah, that's that's a real position of of um, where the customer respects your capabilities and your your authority and your your knowledge. But they don't expect you to know everything, nor should should they, right? Yeah, and and you know, for listeners who've listened to 
you know, obviously our show is called the Learn It All podcast. And so you, you want to hire and bring on individuals who have the capacity for learning agility and want to learn um, and, and continue to grow and evolve. Because if you don't, if you bring on individuals who are kind of stuck and, and, and are not going to uh, even be curious about what the, because like when you have the product person in there, or are you talking to your customers? You should be curious and picking up information. So every oh, time, you, every yeah. time you're doing a call, you're able to at, you're able to at, contribute a little bit more. You know, yeah. you're never going to be a coder. You don't need to be a coder. But if you're if you're zoned out and you're not paying attention, you're not doing anybody any good. Yeah, you got to be dialed in if you're sitting. But you're right. If you're sitting back doing online shopping while the engineering team right. is talking to the customer and you're not absorbing any of this, that's customer sees that's that. not. A, they do. They do. Yeah, is taking risks. In your research, is that where most of the time is spent? Is uh, not taking risks, but you know, de-risking. Yes, it's certainly you know, it's certainly the one that um, I think salespeople would point to most often as the reason they lose to no decision is like ultimately, my customer was just not comfortable with the risk. They weren't comfortable with putting their name on the on the agreement and having the eye, all the eyes of the organization. Uh, look in their direction if the thing went south or went sideways or there was any any return that was below the pr- projected ROI when they made the business case. And so um, uh, taking risk off the table is uh, uh, in de-risking the sale, as you said before, Damon, is something that um, there are lots of ways to do it. And some of those cost us nothing. Some of those are actually pretty expensive. Um, I think where a lot of salespeople immediately jump to is like, well, we don't have an opt-out clause. Like we're, you know, cost us a lot of money to sell and do proof of concepts and pilots. And so we, once you buy it, you, you got, you know, you got to pay for it. And some companies, that's not true for some companies. If you do have an opt-out clause, that's a great de-risking option that you can point to. But even though you, if your company doesn't offer one, there's still tons of stuff you can do. So if you look at some of the free stuff, which you might argue is just good sales hygiene. Here's a, an example I love, which uh, we found that great salespeople were much more likely to, um, pull their implementation team, their customer success team into the customer conversation, the sales conversation before the deal even closed. And the way they would do that is they would come in and say, you know, David, I know we, I know that uh, the proposal's out with procurement legal and they're going to do their thing. But what I'd like to do, um, because I'm assuming we're going to move forward at some point once they're, once this runs through the traps, um, is get a conversation with, um, you know, Allison, she's our head of customer success. She's going to be managing uh, your relationship in working with you on implementation, one of the things we'd like to walk you through is our kind of signature to value map, which is everything that's going to happen um, and all the the steps and all the KPIs that we're going to monitor and all the owners, what we're going to do, what you guys need to resource, what some of the pitfalls and landmines are that we need to avoid, you know, from for the next six months, right? How do we make sure that you are a hero? And this is basically your recipe for like making sure you're getting what you're paying for. And so even doing that, which again, a lot of salespeople would say, that's just good sales hygiene, right? You're getting the customer to start already thinking of themselves as a customer before the signature is even on the, the paperwork. Um, but it creates this psychological safety net, um, it, which gives the customer the feeling like, again, as you said earlier, this isn't your first rodeo. Like you guys have been here, you've done that, you've worked with organizations like me, you know what to do and you also know what not to do. And so you're going to share that all with me. I'm in good hands here. Now, there's other stuff that um, that can cost money as well, right? So uh, one one interesting thing we found from the research is that um, great salespeople were much more likely to sell professional services um, support to their in as part of their deal. Now, I don't mean giving away professional services support. I meant even selling it to clients who say we want to DIY this. We want to just use the online resources, the videos, the customer success support, and we're going to implement it ourselves. Even with those clients, high performers would say, absolutely, you can totally do that. That's one of the great things about our platform is that you can DIY this. You don't need uh, like an army of consultants helping you out. But I also know how important this is for you. And I'd encourage you to carve out a slug of professional services hours. Maybe it's 100 hours. And that way, our A team can come in and swarm any problems because we don't know what's going to happen, right? But we're confident it's all going to go well. But in case it doesn't, I don't want you under pressure and feeling like you guys are slipping or losing traction here. I want to come in, swarm the problem and get you back on track. And then here's another option. So we get to now things that actually where the supplier needs to take on a bit of risk. Um, things like contract carve outs. Um, uh, very quick story. We tell the story in the book, but um, big software company work with um, head of sales uh, was about to close their biggest deal of the year for like a 
It was like a thirty billion dollar manufacturer, and um, they came in and at like what was supposed to be the celebratory dinner. It was the head of sales, his CEO, and the client CEO. This was a new CEO on the client side. Um, they sat down and the client CEO said, "Hey guys, I I don't mean to do this over what I think is supposed to be a celebratory dinner, um, but I don't think we can sign the contract." And it was just like all the air sucked out of the room. And, <laughs> like the waiter was like popping the champagne. He's trying to put the cork back yeah. in the bottle, you know. And um, and so the head of sales said, "Okay, so tell me what's what's going on." And she said, "Here's the problem that when we did the proof of concept and you guys did your assessment of our current state." Um, the business unit you said you probably have the most challenges uh, with was uh, just happened to be our biggest business unit. It's our cash cow. It's our profitability driver. I just got this job, and if we screw that business up, I'll be out. Like you know, fat my head will spin. I'll be out so fast. And so I can't sign up for like a three year term if this doesn't work in our biggest business unit and it doesn't pan out. Like a, it's not worth doing, and then b, it's going to expose me to a ton of risk, and c, I'll probably I probably won't be here. Um, so I can't, I can't commit to that. Um, what the head of sales did on the fly is said, well, why don't we do this? First of all, we, while we negotiated this as a three year, like five business unit deployment, I gave you a price concession based on that level of commitment. We'll, we'll commit to that. We'll, we'll honor that. We will put this one business unit on a one year term cancelable for convenience. If you don't like what you see, um, and you're not happy with the results, you can pull the pull the ripcord on that one and we'll take it out of the agreement and we'll just move forward with the other four business units. Um, now what they did, now the customer said, well, if you're willing to do that, I'll, I'll sign right now, right? So send it to your team, work up the thing, I'll get it to legal and I'll sign it, which they did. Now what the supplier did, what the vendor did was not surprisingly, they sent their top tier professional services team and they they found all the problems, they swarmed all the problems. Yeah. They they Smart. showered them with like tons of support and yeah. they they nailed it. And the client came back after, like it wasn't, the year wasn't even up and said, you know what? We're thrilled with how it's going. In fact, it's going better in this business unit than the other ones. I got to talk to the other guys, but you guys, they, you guys have absolutely crushed it here. Let's just true it up with the rest of the agreement and get it all on the three-year term. So I'm ready to commit for the other two years now. I, I think what you're saying is the sales team, head of sales got creative, you know, got creative and then went the extra mile behind the scenes and and just put all the resources towards making sure that that business unit, um, you exceeded their expectations. I wanted to go back to, for a second, uh, like a lot of times companies implement software, like huge, spend millions and millions of dollars of software. And we see this because we do some Microsoft Office training. And companies are foolish to spend millions of dollars in the product, but not set aside a budget to actual actually on the training, on the on a utilization. And that's what you were saying is that's what great salespeople do. It's almost like it's an insurance clause. You know, it, it's an insurance clause to help do it. So I, I think that that's, that's, that's a great way to help de-risk it. Um, and then another thing that I really like, uh, I wanted to make sure we, talk, we talked about a little bit, is that in the book you talk about if you're going through your proposal, now I'm not a big fan of slide decks or whatever, right? But anticipating objections. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can you yeah. talk about it, that for a second? Yeah. So, so we call this, um, uh, the pre bottle, which is, um, so, you know, as it, we've all been taught in sales, the customer raises an objection, you, you handle that objection or you rebut that objection. A pre bottle is a little bit different. This is where you're anticipating the objection before the customer even articulates it. And that is a huge confidence giver for the customer because it, it does a few things. One, it, it's a tremendous show of honesty, right? So, I mean, you might be worried about you're going to buy 100 seat licenses to our software, and I, especially given the reckoning we've seen and where a lot of people are finding out that none of their seats of access got used in a lot of different platforms, you don't, nobody wants to sign up for that again, right? You want to make sure you have full utilization. And so I want to address that because a lot of customers like you worry about that too. I don't know if it's a concern for you. And you say probably say, yeah, it is. One, we can't afford to have you know 10 people using something we paid for 100 seats. How do we make sure everyone uses it? Let me address how we uh, how we deal with that and how we handle that. And we make sure we get full utilization, but doing it even before the customer uh, brings up. So it's a tremendous show of honesty, but it also, again, it it, it does it has a dual purpose of demonstrating the customer, I've been there before. Like, I know exactly what you're thinking about, even before you've said it. And I think where that's really, really powerful is when you bring up those things that the customer expects, they, like, they're almost afraid to ask. Like, I don't ask about this, but say, you know, you're probably wondering this because a lot of customers do. Let me just get it, get the elephant in the room, like put it on the table and let's talk about it. 
I'd love to, I don't know if it is a concern for you, but I, I want to assume it is, have an honest conversation and tell you how we deal with that, that situation or that problem. I think that I think that's gold. And just to give you a quick example uh, from a SaaS perspective is I was at dinner with a friend the other night. Uh, one guy was a CTO of a, mass, a large company. The other one was a sales guy. And one of the anticipated objections that a lot of companies have are switching, you know, switching from one platform to the next and, and just saying, hey, you know, you're probably concerned about or you're thinking about uh, switching, you know, time and cost. And but that's something that we deal with customers all the time. And here's how we handle it. So again, it's not your first rodeo and just extracting because I've watched a bunch of calls, gong calls or chorus calls, and you could just see that there's something going on in the client's head oh, yeah. and, where they're not saying yeah. it. Right. You know, yeah. and the salesperson has to has to do that. I also uh, one of the other ones you talked about, which I think is important, especially on large, larger deals, is getting executive buy-in, executive support, like the CEO or somebody who can go into the customer, even if it's sending an email or on LinkedIn or, 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 or hopefully a meeting saying, Hey, I'm there. This is important to us. Right. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's a, I would say it's made free to you, but it's not made up free to the CEO. That's why we tell that story as well. But, um, executive sponsorship is a great kind of freebie you can offer. Um, another, again, another great story, uh, enterprise software company, was selling uh, into a large uh, with a big auto manufacturers, and the, you know the deal was it was just taking a really long time to get across the finish line. It seemed like it was going to push into the next fiscal year. Um, this supplier, it was really important to close this deal to to hit their numbers, exceed their numbers. And so, what the salesor did with the CEO's permission was said, "Look, I I know you guys are you know timing our timing may not line be lining up with yours, and we're going to be happy to bring you on whenever you are ready to do so, but." I did want to let you know that our CEO um, personally kind of oversees four accounts a year, four of our top tier accounts. You guys would certainly be one of our top tier accounts. And we've kind of been holding a slot open for you. Um, I love it. We announced that actually on our investor call, um, who some of our top tier clients are. This CEO is a famous guy we all know, actually sits in on the QBRs with you and is personally like, and like we'll give you his cell phone number. Like if you text him, if you have any problems, <laughs> by the way, 99, they never do. Right. But it's like, it feels good. And it just feels like the, the head of the company, the person talking to wall street, the person like whose face is on the billboards, like that person is personally invested in our success. Um, and you know, and then there's a like, you know, and for these top tier clients, what we often do is we carve out a slot at our conference. We want to bring you up stay on stage, maybe be on a panel and showcase a little bit of the work we're going to do, because there's a lot of eyes on this. We tell everyone in the world, we're working with you. Our CEO is personally invested. Um, we want to make this a showcase. Like you're always, you totally guaranteed this is going to go great because we're going to make sure it goes great, right? Well, Matt, think about it. I, I think if for the for the the person, the prospect, or the customer, if they could go back, if they have to go back to their board, or if they have to go back to the other decision makers, and like the CEO is 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 putting his or her name to this, right? There, the, and it's going to get the extra attention, and that helps take off again some of the fear of this. If this goes wrong, of it just being on them, you know, it's just another, it's another thing, and I, and I think it's, I think it's so, uh, it's so important if you can do it, um, and you should do it. We've talked a lot about Jolt Effect. We're almost coming up on time. Is there? I do want to talk for a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, about sure. your, your new book that's coming up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we just um, we got a new book coming out in. May from uh, Harvard Business Review Press. It's called The Activator Advantage. Uh, and we were talking about this before we jumped on the um, uh, the podcast here, but it was, this is our first industry specific um, uh, research study. So we actually, one of the things I've, I've come to understand as a sales, if you will, sales anthropologist or a sales researcher is that there's a big difference between um, selling tangible things um, in selling uh, advice, right? Uh, and if you think about this, it's really a difference between selling products, you know, productized solutions, et cetera, and selling advisory services or professional services. So we actually did a, where the person is the product. And so we actually did a separate study, um, which we lasted about two years. We just wrapped it up and it's coming out in a book in, in May, as I said, um, where we looked at uh, about 3,000 partners in professional services firms. So we're talking about lawyers, accountants, consultants, investment bankers, executive search professionals, PR uh, consultants and, and advisors. Yeah, people who really sell, it, they're selling something you can't touch or feel, right? They're just selling what's kind of between their two ears uh, and their their advisory capabilities. 
that in, in the professional services world, I think as you and I both know, because we are personally in that world, right? We are, are running professional services firms. Um, that is a very different go-to-market model because in B2B sales, like if I'm selling software, I'm selling medical devices, I get a lead usually for marketing. I work that lead. I close the opportunity. Then I hand it off to the implementation team, the customer success team, customer support, the account management team. And those people are responsible for um, upselling, renewing, and making sure the client gets value out of the solution. And I go on to the next deal. So it's very linear in that way. In professional services, um, it's a much more circular process. So I am usually generating the opportunity, typically from my own professional network, right? I'm harvesting from my network. I'm closing the business with the client. Servicing and closing. Then I'm doing the work, right? Because it's I'm selling myself. I'm doing the work. And then I'm setting that client up for more follow-on work. Or maybe I'm bringing in other practice areas or capabilities in my firm and we're upselling and cross-selling and and going from there. So it's, it is a much more circular process where it's kind of not a sales world, but it's this world of like seller doers or doer sellers. So it was, it was a fascinating study uh, and it's really taken off in this professional services world. So I spent a lot, spending a lot of my time out there on the road with um, uh, at partner retreats and in for, uh, with professional services firms. And uh, it's been pretty interesting. Those who know of your listeners who know the challenger work, um, it's a similar kind of study. We identified five profiles of partners or professionals. They're five totally different ones than we found in the challenger work. And, and But a similar kind of arc to that story in a similar uh, study methodology. And you were mentioning there's a great article in HBR right now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We we wrote, um, this is a summary version. If you want a sneak preview of what that um, book is going to be notes. about. What's it called again? It's called uh, What Today's Rainmakers Do Differently. Uh, it came out in the November to September issue of Harvard Business Review. And it's a good summary version of what's going to be in the Activator Advantage, um, the new book. Awesome. Well, let's let's wrap it up. This has been awesome. I mean, I, I I could talk to you for a long time going through all my top takeaways. But um, so what do we talk about today? We talked about that 40 to 60 percent and probably up to 75 percent is around no decision. And this is not for any opportunity. These are for qualified opportunities. And we talked about why people are indecisive, how people think that they're decide that they know how to make decisions, but they don't. And so how to analyze that and see what level if they're moderate or high. And then, you know, going through the whole jolt framework, which it isn't linear, you got to jump in where it's needed, uh, offering recommendations, you know, limiting the exploration, taking risk off the table and, um, knowing how to own the, uh, you need to own the sales process, even when you bring in the rest of your team. So much we talked about. Anything else before we wrap up around the whole Jolt? I think we covered it. We covered a lot of ground. It's because of obviously check out the Jolt Effect. Um, there's a there are a lot of resources at, at uh, JoltEffect.com. If you want to go check that out, there's some tools and some different you know coaching guides and and resources you can download that are not in the book. Um, so lots of good stuff there. And where else can our audience connect with you at? Yeah, so um, a couple of different spots. So we are professional services focused business that does activator training. Um, so if anybody listening is in that space, we are at a dcminsights.com. And then if you're interested in, in Jolt Effect, check us check us out at joltefect.com. Um, we offer uh, Jolt Effect training, and then there's a number of other training programs we offer um, uh, that you can check out there as well. Great. And so for our listeners out there, what I'd like you to do is what I'm going to do is uh, whatever platform you're on, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Spotify, Apple, I want you to copy this link, you know, hit on that little copy button. And I want you to text your friends in sales and say to check it out and maybe even send them a link to buy Jolt Effect and look at Matt's, Matt's work, because I can guarantee you if you're uh, whether you're a business owner or you're in, in sales or a sales leader, you will get value out of both this conversation and Matt's work. So Matt, I want to thank you again. I love this. And for our listeners out there, do me a favor, stay curious and keep learning. Until next time, have a great day, everyone. See Thanks ya. for having me, Damon. Take care.